Today's episode is one that I think a lot of people will be able to relate to. It's on what people don't think about when it comes to their career. It's for people at all stages of their career, from students early on in their career planning to people in mid-career who are deciding they might be pivoting careers or needing a change, but they're feeling stuck, uncertain, confused about their next steps. Dr. Lynn Imai is someone that I've worked with since 2017, and she brings a wealth of experience to this episode. So she's a registered psychotherapist and career counselor based in the Toronto Office of Canada Career Counseling. She is the clinical director of the practice, so she oversees the work of a team of career counselors. And in addition to that work, she's still involved uh, as a professor in the Ivy School of Business. Um, and she is really focused on cross-cultural competence. Um, she, she teaches in the Ivy Global Lab, an international practicum which gives students the experience to work in different countries in developing economies, um, which is so interesting. I find that work fascinating. So Lynn really truly brings a multicultural lens and with her clients in, in career counseling and personal counseling, she draws on psychotherapy to really help people manage their difficult emotions, develop self-awareness. And at the same time, what I really admire about Lynn is she's very strategic. She likes to focus on practical action planning and well-informed decisions. So she has a big brain and a giant heart. And I'm really excited for you to hear this episode, to share it with others who may be struggling with their career and the choices that lay ahead of them. It's never an easy decision, but if you have the right pieces of the puzzle and the right support, you can really get to the bottom of what you should be and bring to this world. And we all have unique gifts and talents to bring which is why I am excited for this episode. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Where Work Meets Life. Today's episode is on what people don't think about when it comes to their career. I'm with someone very important to me today, Lynn Imai, whom I've worked with since 2017. She's a registered psychotherapist at Canada Career Counseling in Toronto. So that is the company that I founded in 2009 and, and she joined us in 2017. And she brings a wonderful background of the industrial organizational psychology doctorate, um, experience being a professor, and she also trained as a psychotherapist and merged that whole counseling side with her industrial organizational background. And she's an absolute delight to work with. And she brings a lot of wonderful expertise to clients in the uh, greater Toronto area and um, to all the students that she uh, works with in the global MBA program, etc. So without further ado, we are going to have an episode today that's near and dear to our hearts about careers and the things that people don't think about when it comes to their career choice, to navigating their career. And welcome to the show, Lynn. Thanks, Dr. Laura. Thanks so much for having me. It is my pleasure. So can you tell us a bit more about yourself, a little bit about your background and why you gravitated towards helping people navigate their careers, Lynn? Sure. So um, I'll start off by saying that I do think, you know, when people do find their purpose in life, uh, it often has to do with helping others on something that's related to your own past pain. Uh, and so I have gone through a major career change myself, um, going from a full-time professor at a Canadian business school, uh, teaching global leadership, to uh, being a registered psychotherapist with a career counseling focus. Um, who does that? You know, I think a lot of people thought that was a really huge change. You know, if you think about a doctor going through, you know, medical school, residency, um, specializations, and then suddenly deciding to leave, it, it's a big shock. Um, um, for me, I had the high pay and the prestige and the uh, job security, you know, um, but at the end of the day, I had to ask myself, you know, if I'm on my deathbed, 
Uh, I'm looking back at my life and if research is the only way that I would make impact on others, would I be okay with that? Uh, and the answer was no for me. So late 30s, I jumped off the career ladder um, against the advice of my family, my uh, friends, even my therapist at the time. Um, and here I am. And I know how uh, scary it could be, how anxiety provoking it can be to change your career. So um, right now I, you know, help people manage their emotions, take calculated risks and navigate their careers into something that's more fulfilling. And uh, I, I uh, have a lot of joy doing that now. Wow, Lynn, that gave me goosebumps, literally. And I know your story. I was involved when we first met you in 2017. And Wow, your story is so powerful and such courage to take that that plunge and do something totally different. Wow. Yeah, no, it, it felt like I'm, you know, standing on top of a skyscraper and and I see where I need to go, you know, and to kind of jump off and hop a few, you know, buildings over. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it, it is scary, but th there's a way to manage it, you know, and uh, it's, it's, it's really fun to give people that process on how to manage that. And now that you're able to look back and have the gift of hindsight, are you glad you did it? And how do you feel today? Oh, for sure. I'm so much more fulfilled and energized. And, um, you know, and I still bring my old self to this work too, right? So, you know, all the cross-cultural global leadership kinds of knowledge and, you know, that that identity is still with me, but um, it, it's, it's a little bit more aligned to how I like to make impact. Um, I love the one-on-one -on -one work with people. I'm, I'm a introvert who loves deep conversations. And so that individual level helping is really aligned for me. That's fantastic. And I know how much the clients appreciate that. And your wisdom and your lived experience, I think, go a long way to helping people. So speaking of people going through career choice, career transition, what are some current trends you're seeing with people when it comes to their careers? I think the first thing I would say is that there are a lot of people who are unfulfilled in their careers. Um, it's, it's very interesting that many clients come to me and they say, you know what, Lynn, you know, I did everything that I was supposed to do. You know, I went to a good school, I climbed the ladder, I have money now, so why am I unfulfilled? Um, so I do think I see a lot of disconnection from meaning and purpose. A lot of people are craving more connection, um, doing something more pro-social, meaningful. Um, and, you know, I, I do think that that traditional career path, climbing the ladder, um, is, is breaking apart a little bit in society. Um, and you see a lot of people taking career, uh, career breaks or changing their careers doing non-traditional work, you know, shared work, gigs, coming back in from retirement. Uh, but, but what's interesting is psychologically, people still tie their self-worth to the traditional notions of success like money and prestige um, and title and those things. And so a lot of my work is helping them undo uh, what they've learned. No kidding. And I think people who are raised by boomers or even elders, I think the values in those generations were very much about sticking it out, grin and bear it, and climb that ladder because security is more important than anything else. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I imagine your family would have been shocked at you <laughs> leaving that prestigious uh, title of professor. Yeah. Well, once you make it, it's, it, you can't get fired, right? So it's the ultimate security. Um, but, uh, you know what, the, your, your other people's dream, right. Um, it may not be yours. So it's, it's all self-defined. Exactly. So when it, when people are struggling with, I want to make a difference and I feel like this mold of climbing this corporate ladder or staying in this field that I went into maybe because of pressure from society, pressure from my parents. What are the top fears that, that come up for them when they're making the choice of, of switching careers, for example? I think there's two main ones, uh, and then there's variance within each. So I think the first main one is, um, what if I make the wrong decision? What if, you know, I end up not liking that career and I can't come back from that? So there, there's a lot of reasons why people um, worry about making the wrong decision. I think there's worry about, 
you know, well, I'm not a good decision maker to begin with, or, you know, I don't have the process or a framework to figure this out. You know, like there, I have a million frameworks about business and analyzing the external world, but not much in terms of organizing my inner thoughts and feelings. Um, you know, I'm not sure what I want to do in my career and I don't know myself and there's a million careers out there and I don't know how they fit together. So, so all of that uncertainty also leads to people worrying about making the wrong decision. Um, I think the other main reason, um, the other worry is, am I even capable of making, you know, a start in this new career? Uh, and so I think a lot of times, you know, when people are unfulfilled in their careers, they go to job uh, ads directly, right? So they go to LinkedIn, Indeed, um, and they're reading the skills and experiences, degrees that you need. And then that immediately sort of creates this sense of anxiousness and discouragement, um, and it kind of shuts down the brain. Uh, and it just becomes harder to think creatively about you know, what are some alternative careers that might be a good fit for me, right? And so there's a lot of that as well. Exactly. And I always like to think the advertised job market is just a, a portion of the whole job market that's out there. A lot of jobs and careers evolve um, outside the posted market through relationships, through conversations, through filling a need that's out there um, that isn't even posted. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's the majority. I, I would even say 70, 75 percent not posted. For sure. <laughs> yeah. And it's so um, depersonalizing to look at an ad and the requirements of an ad and just feel like you're not reaching those criteria. You're not good enough. Um, and then it just can spiral into negative self-talk. And I think we're, you know, as adults, we we are good at worrying about the reality factors, right? Like the feasibility issues, like that that comes first in our minds. But sometimes that can take away from, you know, really properly thinking about all the factors that impact fit for your career. So um, I help clients focus on those pieces as well. Absolutely, you do. So what are some common myths or misperceptions you see people facing in career planning? There's a few I can share. Um, so one big one that we've sort of talked about is, you know, assuming that climbing the career ladder equals career success. Um, that's fine if, if what everything that comes with that really fits you and you value that. Um, but I do think success is something that's self-defined. Um, and, you know, I, I think our needs and goals change as we get older. And, you know, career counseling is not just about finding a practical answer to what your next career is, but really recalibrating what success means to you um, and be becoming comfortable with that, you know, to become more of yourself as you go grow older. Um, so that's one. Um, another one is career planning is about making one big decision, you know, and I think that relates to that previous point about, you know, what if I make the wrong decision, you know, and um, I, I think it's something that career planning is something that we do multiple times throughout our career. And so when, when you fixate on this, this one big decision, it creates a lot of pressure and anxiety. Um, another one is there's only one career suited for me. You know, so that's kind of like saying there's this one soulmate person who's going to fulfill, be in a fulfilling relationship with me. Uh, and, you know, we eventually pick one for, for a lot of people. But I think there's multiple partners, multiple careers that work for us. Um, and so that, you know, knowing that I think takes the pressure away. I think the last one I want to share is um, I need to find a career that satisfies all of my interests. Um, and that that's just not realistic. There are many things we could do outside of work um, that fulfills our interests that, you know, we find joyful and energizes us. Um, and so that's another one that I see. Absolutely. And I think an another one is that you, if you find the right career path, you'll be happy all the time. Not true. So no matter what career path you have, you're going to have good days and bad days, and you're going to have tough moments and growth experiences or opportunities that really suck. <laughs> and I've had a lot of those in my career, but I love what I do. And I really want to help people find something that they love. But with love comes the good and the bad. Would you agree? Right. Absolutely. Right. So there's a, there's a lot of perfectionism, I guess, that happens in the thinking and career planning. Um, so my job is to uh, deal with that as well. 
Exactly. So yeah, you've given us some things that people don't take the time to think about these things. Uh, what I see is they get stuck in their head and there's a lot of noise around careers. Everyone thinks they have ideas for you or input for you when it comes to job and careers and just like relationships, right? It's advice is very forthcoming, but not always accurate. Do you find that, Lynn? Yeah, absolutely. So how should people not go about choosing a career? Let's talk about career choice. So, I mean, we work with clients who are early on, like high school aged, and they're making their very first uh, choice of a career path, for example, or maybe they're in post-secondary and they're navigating that. So they're early career, choosing a career. How should those people not go about doing that? Okay. So... There are a number of shortcuts that I think all of us can relate to when we first, um, you know, choose a career. Um, so I'll give you a couple shortcuts that we use. So uh, one big one is shoulds and pressure from others. So um, I should go into, you know, management consulting at one of the th three big firms because that's what everyone wants and my family and my professor will be proud of me. You know, um, that's one. Uh, if it fits you, again, great. But if it's just the messaging that that's what you should do that's putting you in that direction, then it's not the most strategic and form way of thinking about careers. Um, a lot of it is chance, you know, a job ad popped up in my LinkedIn feed and I applied and I got the job. Or um, I know someone, you know, word of mouth, you know. Um, uh, so, for example, um, I had a friend who worked at the company and she said that I'd be a good fit. And so I applied and I got the job. Um, I, I think particularly in high school, post-secondary, like favorite course, you know, so I like my teacher and um, I like the lectures uh, in biology. So I became a biologist, but then maybe 10 years later, oh, I didn't think about the daily realities of what I'll be doing on the job. You know, maybe you don't like to go outside, right? Who knows? Um, so those are kind of, I, I think we can all relate to them. You know, we've either done one of them or all of them. Um, but the the thing about it, even if it's so common for us to use those shortcuts, um, you know, it, it really doesn't carry any information about who we really are, right? So it's not the most informed approach. Exactly. And the one that bothers me the most is when when young people hear advice about, oh, there's no jobs in that, right? Or there's no jobs, the outlook of that, the labor market is struggling with that. So yeah, don't go into teaching, don't go into nursing, don't go into engineering, whatever it is at that time in the market, then what happens is the young people veer away from those directions. And a big one is our, like, our graphic design, creative arts, those things get a really bad rep as well. Yet there do continue to be jobs in them. Oh, totally. And there's a lot of black and white thinking, right? Especially when it comes to, you know, if I pursue something interesting, then there's not going to be any money in it, you know, or, um, you know, it's just not going to be feasible because there's too much education or something like that. And I, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think there's a lot of, you know, gray zones, right? And it's carefully thinking through them and making it happen. And it's talking to people who have gone before you in those career paths. And I'm always shocked that people can sign up for a four-year degree having not talked to someone in that field before endeavoring on that degree. <laughs> it's, it's a huge investment. And yeah, so you went into this degree and you have not talked to anyone working in that field about what their day-to-day -day is like, what they love, what they dislike, etc. It's just real, a real miss in my mind. People go into these programs thinking, again, like, if I do all the right things, then there'll be a job at the end, then I'll be happy. And, you know, it's, that's not true, right? And so, I mean, part of it is sort of our um, institutions and, you know, not to go off on too much of a rant on our educational systems, but I, I do think we could do a better job, you know, introducing how we think about careers and choosing a career earlier on uh, in our institutions. Yeah, way better job. So I'm glad that Canada Career Counseling can make somewhat of an impact here because a lot of help is needed. So let's talk about what people do not think about that 
you help give them insight into as they navigate their career planning, Lynn? There are a number of sort of psychological factors that I think really informs what kind of careers fit you. Um, one thing is interests, you know, so for sure, I mean, it's easy for some people to sit on a couch and say, these are my interest activities. For other people, it's a lot harder uh, to know what their interests are, but there's usually there's a really deep theme that cuts across different interest activities that people have um, that, so for example, you know, what kinds of themes uh, generalize to sort of the kind of things that sustain flow for you, you know? Um, and so I help clients identify those deeper themes. Um, skills, of course. Um, a lot of skills, sometimes we have blinders, right? So we don't know that we have those skills. And yet when you ask other people for feedback, um, all of them mentioned the same kind of thing, you know? So becoming aware of what your transferable skills are, but also sometimes we have the skills, we know that for sure. And yet um, other people don't really pick up on it. So why is that? You know, have you not had an opportunity to, use those top skills, right? And, and if that's the case, then what are some careers that are a better fit for you? Um, and personality. So this is, you know, what comes naturally to you. So, um, you know, personality is sort of a patterns of how we think and feel and behave. Um, often we're in a career that where we're kind of using our non-dominant hand, right? When it comes to personality, um, you know, we, we find things um, draining. We, we spend a lot of time on it. It doesn't come naturally, um, you know, and so careers would be so much easier if, if you were aligned on that. Um, values are a huge one. You know, we, we, our values are influenced by um, the kind of life experiences we have, and, and we have these sort of life guiding principles we, we adopt. And, um, you know, so is it helping others? Is it flexibility? Is it achievement? Um, and so I help clients really become aware of what those values are, but to really concretely and practically define what that needs to look like um, when, when they do find that in a career. Um, and then future goals, you know, who do you want to be in five to 10 years? Um, are there reality factors? Are there hard constraints that you have to deal with when you're uh, deciding to uh, deal with the career. So those are some of the things that, uh, that do matter for your well-being and, and career fit um, that most people don't think about. Yes. And you've done a great job explaining all of those. It's nice to hear someone else explain um, the way that we work with clients around the different pieces of the puzzle that make them who they are. And when you talked about interest, Lynn, you mentioned the word flow. So getting in a state of flow. But for our listeners who don't know what flow is, can you explain that concept and why it's important? I think most people can relate to, you know, situations where um, they do have flow. So basically it's when, you know, you're doing something, you're really engaged and there's this sort of sense that time is passing by really quickly. And it's that you're hitting that sweet spot when it comes to, um, you know, being challenged, but not being overly anxious about doing something. Um, and, uh, it's, it's really another way of, you know, looking at interests and, um, there are, many different activities that do give us flow, right? Um, but often there's there's themes to it, you know? Um, so for example, you know, I, I can recall one of my clients who had two different flow activities. One of them was building a skating rink for his children, um, and it involved him doing a lot of research and um, investigation into different kinds of, of things he could build. Um, but for him, it wasn't, so, so it was hands-on and kind of research focused and, and looking for information, but also his flow ended when um, he taught the benefits of what he built to his family and his friends. Um, and so, you know, there, there's a theme about research and hands-on work and helping others. And, and um, another one was about doing a family tree and cutting out pictures and finishing his family history tree. Um, and that also involved hands-on work and research. And, you know, for him, that flow ended when he um, taught the the family history to the the rest of the family. Right, so 
there's sort of these deeper kind of, if, if you think about it like an iceberg, you know, there's, there's these discrete tips of an iceberg that seemingly look like different activities that really sustain your interest and flow. But if you look under the surface, there's these deeper themes. And, you know, if you can hit those themes in a different career, how great would that be, right? And you'd be so much more energized and just naturally in it, right? In the zone. Absolutely. And it's getting those themes out that sometimes it's really, you know, take some work to figure out what those themes are for you. But conversations can really, really help. So thank you, Lynn, for describing that so well. Um, so let's turn the tables to you. And I want to understand, Lynn, what does work-life wellness mean to you? And how does it play out in your life? I love that you use the word wellness and not balance. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm a busy person. So um, the, this traditional notion of balance of perfect sort of 50-50 time on work and personal life um, and with clear boundaries between the two, that's just not realistic for me. So for me, well, work-life wellness is energy. Um, to be able to, and sort of thinking about where the, work and the personal kind of feed off of each other. So, you know, I am working a lot of the time, but what are the little things that I can do that energizes me throughout the day? And so it could be as simple as, um, you know, I have a, I have a mini elliptical machine under the desk right there. You know, it might be just going to the gym 250 meters from my, you know, condo, um, I think, I think, but I think the larger uh, piece of it also is if you are in a career that aligns with many of those factors I mentioned, you know, your interests, your personality, et cetera, um, it's just so much more energizing, right? So to be in a career that is fitting uh, for me is work life wellness. That's awesome. Really, really well put. Um, so what do you read or listen to for your own growth or development? So a book, a podcast that you'd want to recommend to our guests? Kind of keeping with this theme of people being a little bit disconnected from their meaning and purpose and this trend of uh, career ladders breaking apart. Um, so one book I recommend uh, is called Evolution to Purpose, Choosing a Life of Authenticity with Work. Um, and this was actually written by one of my dear friends uh, and also former colleague uh, at Ivy Business School. His name is Professor Brian Hong. And uh, he, he is a uh, excellent, um, you know, amazing professor who always gets amazing reviews. And uh, he, he's taught at NYU, Wharton, Ivy. Um, and I like that he is not a psychologist or psychotherapist. He's actually an economist. He's a strategy professor. Um, and the whole book is based on his observations he's had with conversations with students. So when I say students, they're actually more senior leaders, you know, people who go through uh, exec ed and those kinds of programs, MBAs. Um, and uh, he is uh, giving a very astute analysis of why we're disconnected from our meaning and purpose. So there's a million books on purpose out there, right? Like, do we need another one? But this one I think really does a nice job of getting to the root causes of why. And he also gives some practical uh, tips, and uh, I will uh, I will leave it for the audience to check that out. Um, and then, if it's a podcast, um, I I just started with this podcast called The Happiness Lab. Have you heard of that, Laura? I've heard of that one. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Lori Santos. So she she's a professor who um, teaches at Yale, and she teaches a happiness course. Uh, apparently, it is the most popular course that's been taught in the 300 years history of the university. Um, and uh, she draws on a lot of science. And her main thesis is that, you know, many of us do the exact opposite of what, act, what the science shows makes us happy, right? So that's an interesting counterintuitive sort of um, approach. But yeah, I would, I would recommend those two. Wow. And both of them I'm going to check out. But that book, my shelf behind me, which you can see if you're on the YouTube, but I am going to add that to my shelf. And maybe I'll even talk to him on this podcast because he sounds fascinating. Oh, I'm sure he would love to. 
Oh, and someone who's a great professor that really inspires students and loves what they do. Like we don't have enough of those, right? A lot of them go into it and teaching is seen as a necessary, you know, necessary part of the job versus something that you have a real honor to do to inspire these students at all ages. Yeah, we've had great conversations about the contents of that book, but yeah, it's it's great. I think especially for the business community, um, you know, it, it's sort of written in a language that makes sense, right? Sometimes like the counseling could be very different from what people are used to, um, but yeah, highly recommended. Wonderful. So my last two questions are really quick and I ask these to a lot of my guests. Um, what would you do if you didn't need to sleep and you could use that time for whatever else you wanted? <laughs> that is such a Dr. Laura question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> my sleep neurologist partner would say, Dr. Laura, we need to sleep. But um, if I, yeah, so if I didn't have to sleep, if I had superhuman powers, uh, f for me, okay, so it's always been to speak every single language that exists on earth. Um, I speak 2.5, so I have like 7,000 whatever to go. Um, but, uh, it, you know, going back to my, it's in my bio, but I, I grew up in many countries, um, US, Canada, Japan, Belgium, and uh, it, it's the root of all my cross-cultural global leadership work. Um, that, that's always a part of me. And, and so that's one skill I would like. And then when it comes to this work, you know, I would love to spread this kind of hybrid psychotherapy and career counseling work to other parts of the world. Um, mental health, getting help on that is still a stigma in many places. Um, you know, even in Canada, right? Like, a lot of people don't know that career counseling is a thing, you know, um, it is a thing. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's really important. And it's, it's, it's something that, you know, a, a lot of people need and, and, you know, they're so glad they did it. So that would be my one thing I would do if I had all the time in the world and I didn't need to sleep. <laughs> Wonderful. That is so inspiring. Um, if you could have one wish for a better world when it comes to career development, what would that be? My wish is that, you know, that career counseling is not just a skill that's handled by career counselors. I wish that our leaders did that, um, our professors did that, our teachers and the school boards did that. Um, you know, like we said earlier, um, the, the process to really organize our thoughts and feelings like self-reflection is actually not really something that's taught or encouraged, I think, in our educational system. There's too much emphasis on, you know, an analyzing the outside world to, to simplify it so that we can interact with it, that we can control it. But, um, you know, I, I just, as an educator, I personally think that we can do such a better job as we've said before. So that would be my one wish for everyone to be a career counselor. That would be wonderful. And I'd wish for that too. It might put us out of business, but in the end, it would be better for this world and helping people navigate what they want to be and what they want to do and how they want to come forward in the world. And identity is much more than career. So when I say what you want to be, it's how you want to come through in the world. What's important to you? What are your values and how you want to, what, what success looks like to you? So I love that you talked about that earlier because success is very much not a one size fits all. Absolutely. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lynn, um, for your wonderful words of wisdom, your experience, your authenticity in today's episode. Amazing. Thanks so much, Dr. Laura. And I hope you stay well. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Where Work Meets Life. If you found this content valuable, please rate and review the episode and share with others who may benefit. Visit me on my website at drlaura.live and sign up for my monthly e-newsletter full of tips and resources. I'm also a passionate keynote speaker and would be delighted to speak with you on your speaking needs. Stay well.